and welcome to this episode of China Edge brought to you by the SubChina team. I'm your host, Lizzie, an MIT-trained economist turned journalist here at Wall Street TV who covers China and its relation to the world. Here at China Edge, we go beyond the headlines and guide you, our audience, through the jungle of Chinese regulations. We go deep into industry trends and identify challenges and opportunities in the Chinese market. Join our conversation every week for interviews and analysis with the most knowledgeable minds on China. Also, stay tuned for special panel sessions in the future with Kaiser Kuo, host of the Seneca podcast, and Jeremy Goodcorn, editor-in-chief of SubChina. What policy and personnel changes should we expect in the month ahead of the 20th Party Congress in a year? Joining me today is Ms. Ling Wei, Chief China Correspondent at the Wall Street Journal, one of the best sourced journalists on the intersection of Chinese politics and economics. Thank you so much for being here with me, Ling Ling. Hi, Lizzie. Happy to be here. Happy to be here. So, Ling I wanted to start with policy. Given the macro uncertainties this year, what macro policy initiative rollout do you expect from Beijing? Sure. Um, I'd like to take a little step back before answering the question. Um, as you pointed out, we are at a very crucial juncture when it comes to China's political economy. You know, for the past 10 years, we, uh, the whole team at the Wall Street Journal, we had covered Xi Jinping, his rise to power, consolidation of power, and use of all of that power. The fact that he's made himself the chairman of everything has made what we are noticing and reporting now particularly important, uh, namely the limits of his power as evidenced by the economic backlash he's had to deal with in implementing his visions. We have reported that uh, things late last year, the State Council, under the instructions of Premier Li Keqiang, has conducted a series of inspections, mainly of major cities, to basically size up the impact on the economy from Xi's economic overhaul that featured common prosperity, uh, crackdown on private tech firms, and on the property sector. The results were overwhelmingly negative and alarming. Private investments have plunged. Retail spending has weakened dramatically. Even manufacturing, a sector that had held up relatively well during the pandemic, largely because of the strong demands uh, from overseas markets, is uh, sputtering. That's why we're, we're seeing that, you know, at the end of um, uh, economic work conference, uh, which uh, took place in December, the tone was already sharply different you know, from uh, the focus uh, again shifted toward stabilizing growth. In recent months, the economy has been in even worse shape than late last year because of uh, because of the zero COVID policy, which Xi Jinping has made the party's overriding political priority, has further exacerbate, uh, exacerbated all the existing problems. So against that backdrop, we are seeing the leadership primarily under the influence of Premier Li Keqiang is trying to do some course correction in the econ policy. For instance, um, the, uh, Beijing has hit the pause button on any new regulations and laws to rein in the private tax sector. China has relaxed financing restrictions on property developers and home buyers. But so far, we haven't seen any sign of a return to economic liberalization in much needed market oriented reforms that could put the economy on a uh, healthy, healthier and sounder footing going forward. And whether or not that will happen is a much, much bigger question for China's future down the road. Yeah, and so tying that back into personnel a little bit, as you reported in one of your articles published this month, given the salience of the economic hardship, as you alluded to, candidates supported by Premier Li Keqiang could potentially be gaining ground. That include Wang Yang and Hu Chunhua. So who is the leading contender to succeed Premier Li at this point? Are there other rising stars we should take note of? Uh, for sure, Lizzie, Xi Jinping really remains immensely powerful. You know, we all know that his real source of power is the control of the military, the anti-corruption Gestapo, and now the Zhengfa Xitong, right? The legal and, uh, you know, uh, security apparatus. 
Um, those hard power institutions are really his insurance policy against the worst case scenario, but they're not very useful in terms of getting things done. He will have to negotiate with those that can keep the train running, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So that's where we are uh, seeing, uh, that's where um, he may have to make some tactical compromises given the current econo economic pressure. Uh, we, as you pointed out, we have reported that you know, Premier Li Keqiang is trying to get his men in the more important positions uh, coming you know, uh, uh, the next leadership transition, including both Wang Yang and Hu Chunhua. Um, you know, Wang Yang, uh, Hu Chunhua uh, obviously is much younger, he's 59 years old. Um, uh, Wang Yang is uh, uh, 67. Uh, so, you know, both are still within the uh, age limit and who obviously, if he gets a promotion, um, you know, you can argue that um, he probably uh, have much bigger role to play on, uh, down the road. Um, there's actually precedence for for um, for that, you know, uh, in, in terms of uh, Premier having a greater say in determining who the premier's successor is. Mm -hmm. uh, you remember back in the Jiang Zemin, Zhu Rongji era, you know, when both Jiang and Zhu Rongji were retiring, uh, Jiang really wanted Wu Banguo mm -hmm. to be the next premier succeeding Zhu Rongji. <laughs> Zhu Rongji and Wu Banghe Guo at the time really hated each other. Uh, Zhu really wanted Wen Jiabao, and in the end, Zhu's choice prevailed. Mm -hmm. So so that's certainly a possibility that Li Keqiang, you know, might find his biggest legacy as a premier is to influence who his successor is. Uh, that said, uh, we still have uh, quite a few months to go before the party congress. So all the jockeying and power struggle are still going on. Um, you know, um, as we all know that even Mao Zedong and Deng Xiaoping had to deal with rivals and setbacks. They both prevailed in the end. You know, the same could happen with Xi Jinping. So let's see and keep an open mind. Hi, this is Lizzie, host of the China Edge show. We have prepared both English and Chinese subtitles for the show. You can turn on subtitles by clicking the CC icon at the bottom of your YouTube video. Click on the gear icon and select from one of the three languages, English, Chinese Simplified, and Chinese Traditional. 大家好,这里是李琦,在China as you know, last week, President Putin and President Xi had a phone call that seemed to reaffirm Beijing's support for Moscow. But to what extent is that support material or substantial? Um, based on your intel, is there any evidence that Beijing is actively helping Russia evade Western sanctions? Uh, so far, there has been evidence that China is providing substantial military and economic support to Russia. You know, obviously, the U.S. side has laid out clearly what kind of consequences China and its relations with the U.S. would suffer, you know, were it to actively help Russia. Uh, in that sense, the so-called unlimited partnership between Beijing and Moscow is really showing its limits in real time. Um, you know, China's economic interests are just so intertwined with the West, you know, US and Europe, uh, for China to risk secondary sanctions that might result from uh, it providing substantial help to Russia. That being said, um, many people in Washington are still very much skeptical about China's intentions and suspect that they will find ways to help Putin sooner than later, uh, especially given China's track record of evading sanctions. So that's, again, definitely an area we're keeping a very close eye on. Right. And a follow up question on, on leadership reshuffle uh, related to Russia. To the surprise of many, uh, Liu Yucheng was appointed to the state broadcasting body as deputy chief. And as you know, previously, he had been widely tipped to take over Wang Yi's reins as the next foreign minister. Um, is there anything to the rumor that Liu Yucheng was effectively demoted because he misled top leaders on Russia's invasion of Ukraine? That's quite an intriguing story, isn't it? Um, I'm afraid that I, I don't have a very good answer here. Uh, you know, based on what I have heard and what I have read so far, 
I don't think it had much to do with the statement Liu Yucheng made about the unlimited China-Russia cooperation. You know, if you do a quick search, Foreign Minister Wang Yi had said that before, even before Liu Yucheng said it. Um, so I hear that uh, the trouble for Liu Yucheng might not be over yet. Uh, you know how it goes, right? Uh, if the party handle, uh, that's how basically the party handles people who are under ser some serious investigations. They remove you from the existing posts first and then continue the investigation, which can last for months, if not years. Um, so let's let's wait and see, you know, what, what happens in the end. Um, it's certainly a very interesting twist. And now the question is with Le Gang, Obat Gang, you know, who would uh, succeed Wang Yi as the next prime, uh, um, foreign minister. Um, you know, we have heard a couple of names, uh, for example, Liu Jieyi, mm -hmm. expert on Taiwan, you know, uh, but it's still too early to say for sure, but definitely interesting um, to keep an uh, eye out as well. Right. Now back to US-China relations, which is by far the most important bilateral relations uh, from Beijing's point of view. As you know, Secretary of State Blinken made his uh, China policy speech a, a few weeks ago. He laid out a three-part approach to China. The United States would invest in its strength, align with allies, and compete over core interests with China. On the flip side, how would you characterize Beijing's approach to U.S.-China relations for the next decade to come? Um, so uh, there is very little doubt that China sees the U.S. as the biggest threat mm -hmm. to China's interests right now. Um, you know, that's basically why it has shifted a uh, long-standing um, foreign policy focus, right, uh, from building ties with Washington toward aligning with Moscow. You know, when Xi Jinping first came to power, uh, he's um, overriding foreign policy uh, instruction, uh, uh, priority um, that, that was given to his underlings was there were a thousand reasons to get the U.S.-China relationship right, not one single reason to spoil it. You don't hear about that anymore, right? These days, uh, the uh, anti-America propaganda within China is basically nonstop. And uh, on the other hand, you know, state media definitely has consistently played up the China-Russia uh, alignment friendship. Um, and, you know, based on my conversations with contacts in China these days is that uh, there is this prevailing view that the U.S. will shift its attention to further contain China as Russia gets increasingly weakened by Western sanctions. So for that reason, namely the need to counter the U.S., China is aligning with Russia politically and probably will continue to do so for the foreseeable future. But we should also keep in mind that within China, even within the party, there has been a fair amount of discomfort with Beijing getting so close to Moscow. You know, 40 years of reform and opening really means embracing the Western world, right? And the Western style capitalism, getting closer to the United States, uh, Europe, um, countries in uh, Asia like Japan and Korea. So many inside China fear that by getting so close to Russia, China will get even more isolated and its economic development will suffer as a result. But are those fears and worries enough to get the top leader to change policy? We're not seeing any signs of that happening now, but that doesn't mean it won't happen down the road. Uh, I think the bottom line still is the impact on the economy going forward. <laughs> Finally, back to China itself. Many of our audience are from the investment community. Speaking of China's long-term economic trajectory, um, China's recent push for self-reliance, self-sufficiency, and this re-emphasis of its state sector has made many investors quite nervous about whether China is returning to a more puristic form of Leninist economic agenda. This return back to red roots, Hong Se Hui Gui. What's your take on that? Sure. Um... Xi Jinping certainly made a huge political gamble last year you know, when he launched this campaign to move China further away from a market-based economy and laid bare that um, politics in command, is in command as opposed to uh, the economy. Um, so 
as we discussed earlier, we're, we have seen some course correction going on in terms of the income policy. But a return to liberalization is a whole different thing. It depends on who runs the economy going forward. And it also ultimately lies with the political direction of the country. You know, many scholars have argued that for China to continue and deepen market-based reforms, it will have to carry out some much needed political reforms at first, you know, because the reforms the government has implemented so far are pretty basic and those low hanging fruit has been picked already. I tend to agree with that. Um, it, it's very much a question um, that we should, um, you know, gradually get an answer to. Um, for now, I don't see any signs, any um, momentum within China right now to, you know, um, to basically change, uh, change the course, host, you know, in terms of a return to liberalization. Sure. Right uh, now, one one little uh, point I want to add is that, um, you know, the reform generation. You know, uh, Zhou Xiaochuan, Lou Jiwei, uh, Liu He, right? You know, that generation of uh, economic, uh, senior economic officials uh, are, you know, basically all but gone. Mm -hmm. They have either retired, gone into political trouble, getting sidelined. So, um, you know, uh, the, the bench is getting really thinner and thinner. So that's also, a, 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 you know, a, a, a point we need to to consider whether or not you know China have the uh, the bench that's that's needed, the the resolve, the, the the expertise that's needed to restart the liberalization process.